Welcome back to the Football Outsiders Fantasy Show. I'm your host, Scott Spratt, a writer for Football Outsiders, streaming live from an undisclosed location that is possibly beachside. <laughs> but I've, uh, I've taken a break from my sunbathing to bring in Derek Klassen, the hardest working scout in showbiz, to, to help us go through all of the week nine waiver wire options. Derek, how's it going? I take it you're not at the beach this week, you poor soul. I am not at the beach. Uh, the setting here, you know, the weather is better than here than it's been typically, but you know, it's still not the beach. Um, so I don't get <laughs> to say that. Um, no, nothing too crazy on my end. I got a new mic, so I hope everybody can can hear me okay. And I, I sound a little bit smoother than usual. You sound crisp to me, and that's good because we're going to have a lot of things to talk about today. Week nine is always a really difficult waiver wire week, not just because we're a smack in the middle of buys, but because we're actually recording this right on the the brink of the trade deadline. It's you know we're recording this at one p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday. The, the waiver deadline is is for, or the trade deadline is four p.m. So that may impact some of the guys we're going to end up talking about, but we'll we'll do our best to kind of account for that as best we can. Before we dive into the waiver wire options for the week, I'll mention that FO Plus Football Outsiders Plus is now on sale for just 99 cents a week for an annual subscription. This is a limited time offer and it gets you all of our stats, analysis, fantasy, and betting information. Don't miss out on this. It's a limited time offer, just 99 cents a week. Get you access to footballoutsiders.com slash subscribe, or you can follow the link in the description of the show. We'd appreciate if you did that for us. Uh, Derek, let's get started with somebody that I'm giving a 100% waiver recommendation for, something I don't do too often, but that's Michael Carter, rookie running back for the New York Jets. Uh, We talked about him a little bit over the previous weeks. Last week, it seemed like he may have had a blip of performance with nine targets, uh, but then in, in week eight, he had another 14 targets in the surprising Mike White experience, which we'll be talking about Mike White a little bit later, uh, but I want to hear your thoughts on Michael Carter continuing to get more work. Has seen his snap share up at 72 and 70 percent the last two weeks. Hadn't exceeded 52 percent before the week six buy. So is this a post buy rookie running back breakout like we've seen in Cam Akers and, and J.K. Dobbins in recent years, or is this something kind of weird with the games? Or, or what are your thoughts here on Michael Carter? You know, I, I think like I said the last time, I still have some concern about how good the Jets offensive line is. I think they actually played pretty well um, this past Sunday against a, a Bengals run defense unit that is generally pretty good. Their defensive line has typically been pretty good. Yeah. Um, so if they can sustain that level of play, then I think Carter is going to be um, I think he's going to be able to continue to produce. So to me, it really just comes down to the offensive line um, if they can find some consistency. But with Carter himself, like. I mean, the more I watch him, the, just the more he impresses me. He, he's already becoming one of my favorite runners in the NFL. I think like his balance for a guy his size. I, I mean, he's like a, he's like five eight, like two ten. He's a really thick back, and the way that he can take contact for such a short back and, and like somehow manage to stay on his feet. You know, there was one play where he got like hit like three yards in the backfield. It kind of like clips him at his knees. And then he stumbles into a blocker and a defender and like spins out of it forward (laughs) into like three yards. Like it should have been a tackle for loss because he has this like insane balance. He turns it into, you know, a a decent gain. So just the fact that he can consistently do that is crazy. Um, I I don't think he's as explosive north and south as he looks. You know, typically you expect those shorter backs to have like crazy long speed. And I don't think he has that. But I think just in terms of all the the, the patience, um, short area explosiveness, change of direction, balance. I mean, he's just such a complete back. And I think we've seen, we we especially saw it this past week in the numbers. He's a really good pass catcher too. Like he can just, I mean, he just kind of does it all. So I think there are two main reasons that people have kind of been tricked into slow playing, adding him in their fantasy leagues. You mentioned the first one, which is the weight. Sounds really low. It's actually listed at just over 200 pounds. I think you're probably right that it's a little bit more. <laughs> but he's one of those backs where he's bigger than the weight says because he's only five foot nine or whatever. So from a BMI perspective, it's a much better situation than that. I think he probably can consistently handle a heavy workload of 15 to 20 touches a game, which you've seen the last couple of weeks. The other thing is that he just split time in college with another back, Javante Williams, who's now playing for the Broncos. It's just one of those weird situations where North Carolina had two NFL quality backs. Doesn't happen very often, but it happened with a running back that I think we can all relate to here in Alvin Kamara. Um, I guess you could say it happened. He split time with Jalen Hurd, uh, who hasn't really made it in the NFL and is really more a receiver than anything at this point. But I think Carter in another situation would have gotten a lot more work and a lot more running work in college. And I think that helped him fall to the fourth round in the draft and has helped him stay off about a third of ESPN and Yahoo rosters. But I think the talent's going to be better. I think the opportunities are going to be better there for the Jets. So I think 
the, you know, the sky's the limit. He really could potentially be a top, maybe not a top 10, but maybe a top 20 back the rest of the season, especially in PPR formats. With those last two outbursts, he's up to 37 targets on the season. Kamara has 36. He's already in the top 10. I mean, he's he's barely been starting for more than a couple of weeks, Derek. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think if uh, for I, I'm not entirely sure how long Mike White is supposed to be starting. Um, but for as long as he's starting and with <laughs> forever, the <way> that, yeah, <laughs> I mean, maybe if he keeps playing like that, um, uh, but the, you know, and we'll talk more about, uh, Mike White specifically later, but like he did a really, really good job of just top of his drop. He knew he either wanted to get to his first read or he wanted to just check the ball down. And if he can continue to play with that pace and just like, you know, rush the ball out and, and get his, the ball to his playmakers. I mean, if Carter's going to continue to see the snap share and they're going to, to send him out on routes the way that they keep doing, I mean, I, I maybe 10 targets a week it's a little extreme but sure. like he's he's gonna get a pretty healthy workload i would imagine so long as white is, is the quarterback yeah so it, it maybe when zach wilson comes back it could be in a week or two honestly um maybe that's going to change the equation of how frequently the the quarterback would want to check down but consider too that the jets aren't often going to be up in games unless again i guess mike white is, is the next tom brady but if they're going to be behind by multiple scores they need a back that can catch the ball as sort of a safety valve option and i think that's probably more Carter than the other backs on the team, although Ty Johnson's also gotten a decent amount of work in recent weeks as well. But don't you think the game script will probably help him keep the target volume pretty high going forward? Yeah, probably. And honestly, like that's probably just better conducive to his overall production, just to, just in terms of like, like we said, I don't think the Jets offensive line is that good. So yeah. it's, it's probably more conducive, conducive to him getting like quality touches through the air than it would be if he were if he were running the ball. So again, I'm suggesting that you blow your entire fab if that's what it takes to get Carter. Do you think I'm going a little bit overboard there? No. I mean, if we haven't convinced you to spend whatever it was in previous <laughs> shows, I mean, you should just do it now. Like he's he's just a really awesome player. Completely agree. And obviously, a lot of fantasy players are going to be trying to replace Derrick Henry this week, who with a broken bone in his foot, I believe is the issue, is going to probably miss the rest of the, at least the fantasy season. I, I saw some more optimistic type of reads of it lately, but I, I wouldn't expect him back even for the fantasy playoffs at this point. Carter's going to be your best bet if he isn't already on a roster in your leagues. If not him, is it Adrian Peterson? The Titans actually signed him uh, on Monday after the fact. He's on the practice squad now, but I think we can fully expect him to get promoted to the regular roster. And I'm a bit nervous to say this, but I recommended an 81% fab bid for Peterson with a sort of an expectation that he would be the main guy to try to replace Henry. Uh, you know, they've got some backs on the team, Jeremy McNichols most notably, but he's really more of a receiving back. I think he's too small to handle a, a heavier workload. He's only 205 pounds. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think it's Peterson, but maybe this is the number one guy where you're worried that the trade deadline may have an impact. What do you think is going to happen here with Tennessee? I do think the trade deadline, you know, there's still going to be a few hours from whenever the show is done that, that something could happen and they could make yeah. a play. Um, I think the big thing to me about why this could work, even though this has like disaster potential in the sense <laughs> of like Peterson hasn't played very, very yeah. recently and very well, even when he was so. Um, but I think just in terms of like the style of offense that the Titans want to run, they want to be more under center because that's the way that their play action functions. If they want to be yes. more under center with this heavier stuff, that's what Peterson did. He, he Peterson forced Teddy Bridgewater to be that offense back in Minnesota. Like that's just the way that he wants to run the ball. Whereas I think McNichols is a lot more of a guy who you're more comfortable having in the gun. Like you said, more of a pass catcher, that style of thing. And that's just not what the Titans offense wants to be structurally like they, they don't really want to commit to that any more than they already have so i think if they want to continue to be what they were with henry um structurally peterson is obviously going to be the guy for it it's just a matter of how much juice does he have and to that i just i, I have no idea I, we, I none know. of us knows yeah, yeah. i mean <laughs> he, he's played in recent seasons but you know it's been three years since he had a thousand yard season it's been six seasons since he made a pro bowl uh, so, I mean, it's been a while since we've really seen it, but offenses aren't really built the way that, that Peterson is built to play. Like you mentioned, it's kind of the, the Titans are bust, really. He's not much of a pass catcher, but the Titans don't throw a lot of passes to Derrick Henry. He, yeah, works best from under center, so he can kind of build up some speed. It's He's not going to be taking those, like, zone read handoffs and just, like, skirting around the, the corner, right? That's just not who he is. So, honestly, it's like a weirdly beneficial situation for him in fantasy, which is why, again, I'm, I'm recommending the heavy fab spend. But again, this is one where if you're listening to the show and it's still Tuesday, check the news after the show and make sure they didn't trade for, I don't know, Marlon Mack. I, 
Der- Derek, is there like a running back that stands out to you where if they trade for him that, that it just like puts Peterson on the complete back burner for you? Or is it kind of reckless, I guess, to even speculate at all? Uh, it's probably pretty reckless. If the, if for whatever reason, the Browns feel really comfortable with the health of their backfield, like the Ernest mm. Johnson would honestly be like a pretty oh, good yeah, addition to the Titans. Um, but I mean, again, they, there's just no way to know who, who is, is going to be yeah. in on who. Okay. So like w- with that, with that sort of, uh, understanding there, I do think that Peterson could be a valuable back for you. Won't be catching passes as mentioned, but like I could, I could absolutely see him, you know, running in eight touchdowns over the rest of the season, even if this puts a really, you know, like a major uh, problem for the Titans and in, in making their playoff push. So I think that he does have fantasy value going forward. All right, next up, we have a quarterback to discuss. Uh, another unfortunate injury from Sunday, Jameis Winston tore his ACL, wasn't able to get revenge on his old team, the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, even though the Saints actually pulled the upset there. And while Trevor Simeon was a, a pretty capable player in that game, Derek, I'm making the assumption that Taysom Hill is going to end up being the rest of season starter for the team. Um, it's a little bit of a leap, but he was the one that was sort of competing with Winston for the starting job in the preseason. And he was inactive this last week. He's actually missed the last couple of weeks of, with a concussion, but all the news suggests that he's going to be ready to go for week nine. He's going to clear that protocol. And Hill has always been a very valuable player in fantasy. He actually played, uh, started four games for, for Drew Brees last season, averaged 21.2 fantasy points per game during that stretch. Uh, that would have him 10th at the position this year between Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow. So like really heady company that comes a lot more from how fantasy scoring tends to work than necessarily how productive he is as a player. But Hill is also, you know, three and one and that stretch as a starter too. So like the Saints seem to be able to work with him as a, a non-traditional quarterback. What do you think about the Saints going forward this year? Do you think Hill's going to be the guy? And if you do, do you think he can have the success in fantasy this year that he did in sort of a limited stretch last year? I really don't think it should be Hill. Like, I just don't think he can play. I don't, or at least mm-hmm. like as an actual quarterback. I mean, yeah. in terms of fantasy, like maybe he can get value as a runner. But I think what's important to remember is that when he was starting the last time around, that roster on offense was a little bit better. The offensive line, I think, was healthier. They had Jared Cook, which was uh, better, and the, yep. the wide receiver core was a little bit better. And so now, when you take all of that away, and it's going to kind of be like all right, Taysom Hill, you're going to have to like make some big boy throws, even though they don't throw the ball a ton and they're going to want to run very much. Like yep. he's still going to have to make a few key throws. Um, and I just, I really trust Sean Payton, but like the talent just isn't there if you're not like a competent level quarterback. And I just am not very confident that he is. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I'm not too excited about it. It could be a situation where Sean Payton just decides to get like really insane with it and have like a triple option day and just <laughs> get him 150 yards on the ground who knows but um I, I don't know i'm not very confident in him as a passer so like the line of thinking that i have was like the fact that the saints don't have a very good wide receiving core is almost a reason to stop throwing as many passes to, to wide receivers right like that would be a reason to run this like weird run heavy offense especially with the defense that's helped to protect leads the, the one sort of problem with that line of thinking is that hill has a major history of putting the ball on the ground and it's like you can't really turn the ball over with this style of offense and expect to have success even with the quality of their defense so like there are definite major pros and cons with the situation. Uh, did you get to see any of Simeon last week? Like, were you impressed with him specifically, or is this more a situation where the Saints maybe ought to be looking at adding a quarterback since they're in the playoff mix? I think they should add somebody. I don't know if it's bringing back Bridgewater or or what, but like, I, I think they just need Simeon is fine in like this particular situation that he got stuck in, where you're just kind of coming mm-hmm. off the bench and you have to. Um, not completely mess things up to win the rest of the game. But if you're thinking that he has to start for four, five, six more weeks or whatever for the rest of the season, like that's just not a viable strategy. And to me, neither is Taysom Hill. So yeah, I would hope that they're looking at something b- before the trade deadline. I don't know, but um, I-, I wouldn't really feel good about either of these quarterbacks from a fantasy <laughs> perspective, I don't think. <laughs> Fair enough. On the YouTube chat, Joey Sucks says that he came here to correctly for us to correctly predict the future, not be locked by the limits of human perception. So I apologize. I'm going to blame it on the beach trip. I'm just not really fully locked in this week with the third eye the way that I have been in previous weeks. So apologies there. Hopefully you'll stick with us for the rest of the show. Anyway, we've got some other good fantasy waiver wire options for week nine to discuss. The next one actually is a really intriguing one. I think Brandon Ayuk, wide receiver for the San Francisco 49ers. We're down here where I'm recommending, you know, 5% bids, that kind of stuff. So these are more flyers than anything else. 
But I was encouraged to see Ayuk, if not necessarily with the, the production, just four catches and 45 yards on seven targets. Uh, but he, his trending of snaps is, is really encouraging to me. You know, over the last four weeks, it's gone from 67% to 71%, 71% again. And then this last week, 88% was a season high. You know, he's not exactly lighting it up with 90 yard games like he did through a big chunk of the season last season. But it sounds like Kyle Shanahan's been encouraged. Derek, have you been encouraged at all by what you've seen here or just maybe the trends that are happening with the team? Uh, I mean, like a as a player, I don't really care for Ayuk that much. I think mm -hmm. the thing, I think like he's kind of linear in his usage. He's very much a guy who is, is really good on like those slants and glances uh, that the 49ers really love to love. And I think he's good with the ball in his hands, but I don't think he's a complete receiver. The thing is that that probably doesn't matter because yeah. if Kyle Shanahan isn't doghousing him and he he's going to get him on the field, that's kind of all that they're going to use him for anyway. And I think he does a decent enough job doing those things. Um, and I think if we assume that he can take any level of, uh, of development, just in terms of being a little bit cleaner out of his breaks and stuff like that, then he's probably going to continue to, to get looks and, and produce at a decent level because even for as turbulent as the 49ers offense has been, some of that has been injuries. Offensive line is not particularly the great quarterback True. situation has been awry. Like, I think if things can stabilize to some degree, um, whether it's Jimmy just not playing like an idiot a, as much as he was earlier in the year, um, and maybe I just continuing to get this amount of snaps, like I think he can probably be like a, a, a decent bet to be, you know, a startable flex player or something. So I guess there are two, I guess, huger roadblocks to come in his way. One is the fact that George Kittle, I think, is eligible to come off IR, could play in week nine. Uh, and if not, it's going to happen very soon. And that's going to put a major dent in the target share for any of these guys. And there really hasn't really been much after Debo Samuel available for anybody else anyway. The other, I'm, I'm a little less sure how, how to read it, but like, Derek, you think Trey Lance, I've kind of grown more pessimistic that he's going to make a major dent in playing time th the rest of this season. But do you feel differently or is this more about maybe Jimmy Garoppolo not playing well than it is about Lance and how ready he is for the NFL? I just think Lance is not not ready to play year one. And I still really liked him as a prospect. But like, yeah. I mean, he was a, he's like a 20 year old year old who didn't get to play his 20 year old season. <laughs> and now he's coming into an offense that has typically been very hard to to pick up. So. Um, I think it's just a tough spot for him to produce. I, I do think Jimmy was just like straight up not playing very well earlier in the season mm -hmm. and then he got hurt. So just kind of a weird year for him. But if he can at least get back to like what we imagine is like his ideal average level of play, that's probably enough for this wide receiver core. Um, I in particular to, to produce on, on some level. Okay. Let's take a quick break to mention that we are live Monday through Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, you can you can chat with us live on, on YouTube, or you can watch us on Twitch, Twitter, or Facebook, whatever you choose. Some combination of Derek and I doing fantasy stuff. I do fantasy Tuesday and Friday. We also have uh, Mike Tanier and Aaron Schatz doing some real football outsiders talk. Please check all of that out. And again, reminder that FO Plus is currently on sale for 99 cents a week for annual subscriptions. It's a limited time offer, so jump over to Football Outsiders dot com slash subscribe or follow the link in the description of the show to check that out Derek some more waiver wire options for you this week Dan Arnold the tight end for the Jacksonville Jaguars um, I've always had a particular liking of him it's like he's always been one of the positional leaders and you know yards per catchable target some of the more like advanced metrics -y type of stuff that suggests he's a little bit of a downfield threat and an efficient tight end but the workload really hadn't been there and he's been traded around the Jaguars are actually the fourth team in his four-year career which is pretty crazy to me but suddenly on the Jaguars where they have some injuries to guys like DJ Chark and James James O'Shaughnessy, he's getting a little bit more run. He played 32% of snaps the week after he got traded, kind of a slow start, but then 73%, 62%, and 72% the last three weeks, playing a lot ahead of some of the blocking guys like Chris Manhurts. Uh, he had eight catches for 68 yards this last week, has an 18.4% target share the last three games, is ninth highest among tight ends. So are we looking at a tight end one in fantasy, or is this kind of a blip? Like, What are your thoughts there, Derek? I mean, if the Jacksonville Jaguars wide receiver core is going to continue to be as bad as it is, <laughs> I, I think those targets are kind of just going to naturally flow to Arnold. Whether like I, I think he's like a fine player. He he's probably gotten moved and cut a lot because he can't block and his hands are kind of not reliable. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I think to your point, he does get open um, pretty consistently, and you can use him as as a bit of a field stretcher. And I think the Jaguars have tried to do that a little bit. Yeah. Um, 
And maybe I guess the hope is just that the longer he's in the offense, the more comfortable he gets with Trevor Lawrence and stuff like that. And again, like the just who else is really like a huge threat to steal targets away from him because they're so good. Like Jamal Agnew gets targeted a lot, but he's not like actually good. Um, Marvin Jones is not as good as he used to be. Um, I don't think LaVisca Chanel is a wider favorite. Like, the, like nobody should yeah. be really taking that many targets away from him. So I think just kind of from a sheer volume standpoint, I think he's probably a fine play here. And LaVisca Chanel, it's like, it seems like he's shifted a lot to playing a lot more outside receiver after the DJ Chark injury, which is, I mean, I don't know if you feel this way, Derek, it seems like a real round peg, square hole, whatever that phrase is, situation, where it's just like, he's probably at his best, like if not taking jet sweeps out of the backfield, it would be probably working more toward the middle of the field. So it's just like his target share is kind of plummeted. Um, which has kind of turned Jamal Agnew into a maybe deeper league fantasy option. But like, it's definitely helped with, with Arnold's target share. And it's just kind of hard to see this changing. Shark's not coming back this season. Uh, like maybe they'll shift strategies or something, but uh, the Jaguars are going to be trailing a lot too. Like we mentioned with the Jets, are going to have to throw the ball. And it's it's hard not to see Arnold have a pretty hefty target share the rest of the way, isn't it? Yeah, I think I agree. And, and especially the thing with Chenault, I agree with. Like he's just not... <clears throat> an outside receiver like he just yeah i mean to your point he's a guy who you want him working over the the very short middle of the field where he can get like bully yards after the catch where he can catch you know a shallow and, and and hit a linebacker for an extra two yards where you can get him on jet sweeps where you can get him on screen passes and stuff like that like they even gave him a carry last week which is probably <laughs> how you should be using it like that's the, that's the style of stuff that you should be doing he's not a guy that you can can put out on the edge and and win one v ones it's just not but if, if that's what they think is all that they have on their roster, then it's probably a bad situation for him and good for Arnold because he's not because Chanel's not going to get open that way. Yeah, I mean, James Robinson suffered an injury and had to leave the game, and that, there was some scare that it might be a little bit more serious, but I think he's going to be back in a week or so. So no major hurdle there, but like they were going to be stuck either running Carlos Hyde every play or maybe actually using Lewis Chanel as a running back for a week or two. Uh, so that, that kind of tells you the state of that, of that offense right now. It's, it's not a great situation, but maybe it'll be good for Arnold from a fantasy perspective. Uh, best you can ask for on this show, I guess. Uh, so Arnold, we mentioned was traded. There's some other guys on this list that I think are, are on the list of potential trade candidates for the trade deadline coming up in a couple of hours as we record this. But maybe some of these have value if they stick put too. Derek, I'd like to get your thoughts. The first of those is Devontae Parker, wide receiver for the Dolphins. He's kind of been in and out of the lineup this season with some injuries. Hasn't really intersected a ton with Tua Tonga Vailoa. Um, they've just kind of, for whatever reason, Tua has been hurt when when Parker's been healthy and vice versa. But when they've played together in nine career healthy games. Uh, he's had decent line, 7.4 targets per game, 53 yards per game, 0.22 touchdowns per game. It adds up to 10.8 fantasy points, PPR leagues. You know, that's top 50 among wide receivers, but not like top 40 or top 30 or anything. It looked like a little bit more of a volume last week with eight catches and six or and 85 yards. I don't know. What do you think of Parker in this offense, especially with all of the like, you know, up in the air missing pieces like Will Fuller could be back in a couple of weeks. You know, we've seen Mike Gasicki get more run, but has that been really more about other injuries? I don't know. What do you make of what's going on down there with the Dolphins? To, I, I hate their off. I, 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 this is a mini like not fantasy rant. I mm. despise their offense. It's a ton of RPOs. It's a ton of like super basic quick game. I just don't think they trust their offensive line or quarterback to run a real offense. And it's yep. very frustrating to watch. Um, anyway, at least as far as Parker, <laughs> like he is probably their best, like pure outside receiver. And that means that he's going to always mm. naturally have a role in the offense that way. Um, He's also, at least among their wide receivers, you could call Gasecki a wide receiver. He kind of, he really is at this point the way that they use him. But Devontae Parker is also a really good jump ball guy. I mean, I think we saw that yeah. even last week. He had one like two or through this like crazy hole shot between um, like right down the sideline and Parker went up for a 50-50. I was just like, I don't even know how he came down with it. And that's the kind of place he can make. And like Tua, for all the, the, the problems I have with him, he's very willing to just make those throws and just chuck it up and be like, okay, my guy can go get it. And so I think to your point, if if they can get some t- healthier games together where they're actually playing um, and, and not one of them is out of the lineup yeah. and one of them's in that sort of thing, maybe you can just hope that that two is going to keep forcing those targets to him. Um, again, I really just hate their offense as a whole, so I wouldn't be too excited about betting on anyone in it. But I mean, if two is going to continue to be a guy who just forces these jump balls and stuff on occasion, then Parker's probably their best guy for that. It's interesting what you're saying about the jump balls because I've been making the point that both Gesicki and then uh, and Parker both were I think bottom three in average yards of separation last year according to Next Gen stats. 
And I was thinking that, you know, with Tua's poor arm strength relative to other quarterbacks, that might be why the Dolphins were trying to add guys like Jalen Waddle, like Will Fuller with speed, with separation ability, maybe let him make good decisions, find the open man and kind of work it that way. So I don't know whether you think this is a situation where he just hasn't had that full complement of speedy, hopefully separating type of players and has had to kind of fall back into the habits of throwing jump balls? Or do you think, is that just something that Tua is going to be willing to do no matter who's in the lineup? And that and that's why Parker could maybe sustain the value that he showed last week. I think Tua is kind of just okay with throwing those balls no matter what. I think the reason that they signed guys like Fuller um, and drafting Jalen Waddle is not necessarily because Tua – needs those guys because that's like his favorite or whatever i think like yeah. the offense as a whole just didn't have those type of players and i think the the better you can build your wide receiver core to have a guy who can do a little bit of this and then a different guy who can do a little bit of this and you can piece it all together to make this this really good complementary offense that's what they need and i think that's why they tried to yeah. do what they did this off season um so I, I think even if they get guys back like like i said parker at least still fills a very particular role in the offense and i think to a is pretty willing to just kind of chuck it up and, and say whatever. Well, that's encouraging. And at least for right now, it seems pretty clean. So Parker played 91% of offensive snaps last week, Waddle 94%, Gasicki 97%. And then the next highest wide receiver, I think, was at like 12%. So it's like, you know who the guys are on this offense. So even if it isn't a spectacular passing offense, as you suggested, uh, maybe it isn't. Uh, these guys, I think it's pretty clear who the fantasy players are and who the fantasy players aren't. Although I guess all bets could be off if Will Fuller can ever make it back. But uh, given his track record, who could say when or if that will happen, unfortunately. All right, let's move on to another player, uh, Pat Fryermuth, tight end, rookie tight end for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, he's been kind of piquing my interest of late, Derek, because this kind of started with Juju Smith-Schuster suffering the shoulder injury that's going to hold him out for the rest of the year. Me looking at the roster and being like, who can really kind of fill this role? Like a lot of their backup wide receivers, it's like James Washington types that are really more field stretchers. They, they can't work the middle of the field the way Smith-Schuster can. I mean, obviously, very talented player. You don't just have backups that can do that. But even from a style standpoint, and I was wondering if maybe Fryer moves could help fill that void a little bit. And then the last two weeks, it looks like it's kind of been trending that way. 60% and 78% snap share. I think that's, that's the last two games, not the last two weeks because of a buy. But those are his season highs. Had seven targets each of the last two weeks. Uh, so it looks like it's kind of maybe trending in a positive direction. What have you seen from Fryer moves so far? I know fantasy players are always reluctant to trust tight ends in the rookie season. But maybe this role could make it a little bit different for Fryer moves. He, he's been impressive to me. I mean, I think it, there's a couple of things I think going for him. One, I think we saw this past week in particular, like when they were playing the Browns, they're not typically a team that wants to get into like 12 personnel um, and run the ball and like attack in the middle of the field. But I think we saw against the Browns in particular with a depleted linebacker core um, and just frankly, not very good linebackers for the guys that they were playing. I think they did a really good job of, of getting into 12 personnel. They're comfortable enough with Friar Muth blocking um, that they didn't feel like they had to take him off the field all the time for that stuff. Yeah. And then when they went into like empty and stuff, they would just line him up in the slot. He had a couple of good plays where um, I think he caught like a, a second or third down on like a weak side option, which I think was really impressive. They had some plays where they split him out by himself. Like, you know, like we see with Kelsey all the time. Yeah. Um, so like, I just thought it was really encouraging that they could play him from the slot on the line. Um, why off positions, they could spread him out at a receiver. Like the fact that they trusted him to do everything as a rookie, I thought was really impressive. And then just the way that I think he kind of sees the ball in when he's contested. I mean, the way that he caught that touchdown over a guy's mm. back. It was, it was pretty gorgeous. insane. Back of the end zone. Like it yeah. was a really cool play. Like toe tap. Like, I mean, it, it was just an awesome, awesome play. And so um, maybe you won't get a, a, a catch that special every week, but just the fact that I think he can do it is, is pretty impressive to me. Um, I mean, I thought he just mostly looked great. Like the only bad rep I can remember is like they had one play where they were running like trips left and he was the lone tight end on the right side. And um, Greg Newsom, the, the Browns rookie cornerback, is just a lot yeah. quicker than he is, which ma which makes sense. Like, Frymuth I mean, he is a tight end, end. Yeah. Yeah. And so he just kind of had like a really good rep against him. But I think generally Frymuth has just been really impressive, both as a pass catcher, as a blocker. I think they want him on the field and I think he's done a good job. So the way you describe that, it makes me a little bit nervous because the, the the fact that he has versatility, when you pair him with Eric Ebron, who was inactive last week, Ebron is really only a receiving threat. I don't think he's much of a blocker. Tell me if you disagree. But like, if Ebron is able to play and they're relying a little bit more on 12 personnel, again, with Smith-Schuster out, 
is that going to force Fryermuth into more blocking situations in future weeks because they can't do the same with Ebron and it just kind of has to be that way? Or do you think it's pretty clear at this point that Fryermuth is going to be the primary tight end target in addition to being also a versatile player for the, for the team? I would not be surprised if they phased Ebron out. Because, mm-hmm. like, to your point, he is really more of just, like, a, a receiver. He, he's not a guy who you want to put on the line and block very much. He, he doesn't do a very good job of it. I think even as a receiver, he's not been particularly impressive as of late. And so I think if you have a young guy who can do more the way that Frymuth can, I think it's probably more conducive to their success that they – um, start to lean on this. And again, I think with some of the success we saw from them getting into 12 personnel with, I think there are other guys like Zach Gentry. Um, they had some plays of like Derek Watt being the other tight end. Like, I think if they can incorporate that to being a more part of their offense, Fryer Muth is, is very, very clearly the guy for that as mm-hmm. opposed to Ebron. Fryer Muth's up to an 18.9% target share since week six. That's ninth among tight ends. So kind of puts you in that Dan Arnold range with slightly mismatching timelines. I suggested Fryer Muth is a little bit less for, for a fab bid, but it's honestly more about what I expect the broader opinion to be about these two players. Do you have an opinion on which one you would rather have for the rest of the season in fantasy? Is it Fryer Muth or is it Dan Arnold? Uh... I mean, the volume, I think that Arnold is probably going to get just because of the stuff like you mentioned, mm-hmm. like game script. I mean, the Jaguars yeah. receiving core is just a, a lot worse, obviously, than the Steelers is. Like, there's a lot of other guys that can can take targets away from Fryermuth um, in the Steelers offense. So this is probably a situation where I think Fryermuth is a, a much more valuable real life player. Yeah. But is maybe a, a little bit more of a hit or miss value in terms of fantasy, whereas I think Arnold, the way that that offense is going to have to throw every week with not other guys to really feed the ball to. I mean, Arnold is probably the safer play, I would imagine. Makes sense to me. I think I agree as well. So let's hold on to the next player. We got Cole Beasley, wide receiver for the Buffalo Bills. I'm suggesting as a 3% fab bid, not to get too carried away. Uh, But he had 10 catches and 110 yards last week on 13 targets, led the team by six. If he kind of did that work every week, you'd obviously love him from a PPR league perspective. I'm unsure if that's going to continue, but there are two narrative reasons I would say that you could definitely see it happening. One, there have been stories popping out about how Beasley turned off his Twitter. Uh, He had been in in some pretty heated discussions, I think, dating back to some off-season comments about his thoughts about COVID and the vaccines and such. But that is out of his life, hopefully out of of his concerns. Uh, He also, I would say, maybe getting a boost from Dawson Knox being out. Knox is a tight end, but uh, you know, it's one of the main three, I guess, pass catching options on the team when he's healthy. He has a broken hand, going to probably miss the next couple of weeks in addition to this last week. So maybe Beasley got the boost there, but maybe it's random. I don't know. Derek, what are your thoughts about Beasley? Did this game change your mind about his role might be, assuming that it didn't change your mind about him as a player? I mean, it's tough because I can I can probably argue both sides of this. He, he's, this mm-hmm. is definitely a situation where it's tricky. I think, to your point, Dawson Knox being out, I think, really helps Beasley because if the, if we assume that Dawson Knox is a guy who can attack more of the middle of the field and that sort of yeah. thing, even if Beasley is, is obviously not as big of a body and stuff, he's the guy who is really comfortable at sifting through zones and, and, and you know, getting yards after the catch over the short middle area of the field. So... If with Knox out of the lineup, they prefer to lean on him rather than their other tight ends for that, I think that could be value. I think also to your other point, there's just like an insane degree of randomness to these Bills mm-hmm. wide receivers, I think, which is good for them in like a, a real life perspective that you can Agreed. like always, yep. there's always like a great receiver that you could have that could just have this game. Um, and it doesn't matter that Emmanuel Sanders doesn't catch a single pass that you can still win by double digits or whatever. Like <laughs> that's great for them as a football team. Um, as a fantasy analyst, it's really hard to pin down because, you know, Sanders has also had games where he scores two touchdowns against 90 yards. Like it's, yeah, I think it's kind of tricky. Um, I think these type of games where he goes 10 for 110 is like, that's probably not going to be what you should be expecting. But I do think with Knox out, it's probably, it, it would make sense that he could get a few more targets maybe than he was previously even. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're taking the words completely out of my mouth here because, again, it, like, it seemed all good. He had 71% of the snaps played this week, a really high number based on what he's usually seeing. But even when Knox was healthy, he had those random weeks, like 91% in week one, 87% in week six. Knox was basically in for both of those games as well. So he has these kind of random games. Last year, he had, uh, I think, five 100-yard receiving games just kind of out of, the, out of the blue. And then he followed them up with less than 45 receiving yards in each of the subsequent games too. So like, 
like there's a major whack-a-mole situation here. My guess is that it's like matchups driven, like he's finding mm -hmm. opportunities to exploit defenses that maybe can't handle him from the slot. But that is, I would say, a lot harder to identify ahead of the time than you might expect. Um, so like, I guess I would settle in. He's got a 21.2% target share for this, the season. That's 35th among wide receivers. To me, that's kind of what it is. It's like he's like in the 35 to 40 range among wide receivers from a PPR perspective, but it's going to be potentially incredibly volatile, especially because he's not like a major touchdown threat, but like among the guys that are just getting targets, like it could be two one week and 12 the next week. And it's going to be really hard to tell, even if Knox misses more time. I expect Knox to be out the next two weeks um, after this one. So you may get a little bit of an opportunity to run with Beasley, but I wouldn't be shocked if he had, again, two catches for 20 yards next week. It's just really hard to tell. <laughs> uh, okay, Derek, more slot receivers to discuss. Next up, Jamison Crowder, wide receiver for the Jets. Here's another one of those players that I was mentioning has been in a lot of trade discussions. You figured that he would probably be a good player for the Jets to trade away. Like He's a good player, but he's blocking Elijah Moore, the rookie, that I think would probably do his best work in the slot, given the team has Corey Davis on the outside. Uh, but Crowder has been pretty consistent, like a, much more so than Beasley, at least, uh, so far this season. He's played four games since a, a groin injury that cost him the first three weeks. He's had between six and nine targets uh, all, all four of those games. Obviously, if Mike White is the next coming, then, then Crowder should have a lot of value. You, but what do you expect here with Crowder and just with the Jets more broadly the rest of the way? Um, uh, again, it's kind of just for as long as Mike White is the quarterback, I think this is probably a decent play. I think we saw, um, mm -hmm. especially last week, like if the offense is going to be so like focused on the, you know, five to 15 yard area in terms of passing it and really just trying to get the ball out at the top of the drop and, and praying that you guys can win over the middle of the field and stuff like Crowder is still really good at separating the short in the short area. You know, if he has to, if he has to run like an option out or something, he's really good. Um, not as good when he got pressed. There were a couple of reps where like, I think one of the interceptions, like Mike Hilton um, pressed him up really good and then ball bounced off of him and uh, the, the Bengals picked it off. But like, I think he's still generally very good when he gets space. I think he just, he's, he's a veteran guy who does a really good job of understanding where those zones are. Um, and his, his hands are still mostly pretty good. So yeah. again, I, I think for as long as Mike White is the quarterback and they're going to attack that area of the field, I would say he's probably a good bet. I also do think to your point, they should probably trade him because the year is over. Elijah Moore can do a lot of the same things and you obviously want to get your younger guys reps if you can. And there's probably some needy teams that could use a guy like Jamison Crowder. You know, I don't know what the Chiefs like. I don't know how much they're willing to give things up, but like they could use a guy like him um, in their offense. So. I don't know. I think it's, uh, I, like I said, I think for as long as White is playing, it's probably fine. So Crowder has an 18.4% target share since he's been playing. That's 43rd among wide receivers for the season. Again, I think that's kind of the right range. He's very similar value to Cole Beasley for me in a PPR format, although probably more consistent week to week with a lower individual weekly ceiling. Uh, so that's where he is now. But if he got traded, do you think on the whole, that would more likely be a plus or a minus for his fantasy value? Like you would figure it would probably be a plus. You would assume that he would be going to a better passing offense, probably a team in the playoff mix that would want to add this veteran on the last year of his contract. But it could lead to a more crowded situation. You know, it, it could lead to a team that maybe was able to run the ball more because of game script reasons. Like what are your initial thoughts about what would happen to Crowder if he was traded? My assumption, it, it obviously depends on the team, but my yes. assumption would be that if a team is trading for a player with such a specific skill set like Crowder, mm -hmm. it would be because they want to get him the ball and they want to put him on the field. Yep. So I, I think it would probably be... <clears throat> pretty good for him if he got traded like I, I don't think I would feel any worse about him uh certainly um the game script thing could be tricky but I mean unless it's like the Cardinals or the Rams I think you're probably still going to be okay enough in the, in the game game script department that a good passing offense that is clearly trading for him for a reason with a plan yep. is probably still going to be pretty productive for you Absolutely. Okay, great. One more slot receiver to knock it off the list here. We got Randall Cobb, wide receiver for the Green Bay Packers. We're down in that 2% fab range that I'm talking about here. So you're kind of taking a little bit of a flyer. You know, I'll say that last week, it's probably not going to happen again. He had three catches, 15 yards, but had two touchdowns on five targets. To me, that was just a product of Devontae Adams, Alan Lazard, your top two wide receivers on the COVID list. Couldn't turn it around so quickly for the Thursday night football game. Those players, I think you'll assume would be back after the 10 extra days off until their next game. Uh, so Cobb kind of had to fill the void as a temporary wide receiver one. It's a weird situation. Uh, hasn't had a lot of touchdown opportunities over the course of the season. I think 
uh, only 2.0 expected touchdowns uh, in the first seven games of the season. Um, but what's interesting too is like there were other wide receivers that saw big increases in their workloads here. Equinemia St. Brown was up to 92% snap share. Jawan Winfrey, 74%. To me, those are more traditional outside wide receivers. They were probably the more direct replacements for, for Adams and Lazard. And if you look at Cobb's snap shares overall by week, there was kind of a trend that was happening even before the week without his teammates available. Uh, he got traded before the season. It was 26% snap share in week one, then 18%, 38%, 46%, 55, 39, and then 63 and 68 the last two weeks. So he had set a season high even before this last week. Do you think that trend is something that you expect to continue? Or do you think, again, this was a weird situation in one game and it was it was more of a blip than anything else? I think it's probably more of a blip than anything else, um, you know, just with a, a lot of the wide receiver injuries. But like even Robert Tanyan going down. That's true. Um, I think probably really helped him. And I think he was probably their best like immediate fix for that. Um, just in terms of like the area yep. of the field that he's going to attack. And I think now with like a bye week or, you know, with a bye week coming up, like, I, I don't know, like, I think it's entirely possible that they have a more long-term plan and fix rather than just having Cobb, you know, fill in for Tanya and snap. So I don't know. I, I think he just doesn't really have too much left in the tank. I think he's a nice player that they can get onto the field um at times but like i'm just not very excited about what his value is mm -hmm. going to be here i think when they get their outside receivers back i think that's really what they want to do in the passing game um and i think it's more likely um that they just don't target the, the middle of the field as much um and really just try to get the the deep ball going run the ball a little bit more that sort of thing yeah if i was going to bet on this and again everybody listening to this after the fact will probably already know the resolution of it i would say the packers seem pretty likely to trade for a tight end to replace tanyan they just don't really have much behind them they've got mercedes lewis more of a blocker i think dominique daphne just came back but i'm like not lighting the world on fire there jay sternberger is gone he's with washington at this point really never worked out much anyway so like could this be an Evan Ingram team, maybe? Like, I think there are some names there that you could fill in that while they wouldn't necessarily replace Tanyan, they would probably marginalize Cobb to the point where he wouldn't be getting those 60% snap shares and would probably be outside the top 60 in PPR formats. So, like, I'm suggesting a 2% fab bid for him now, but I think that's subject to change just over the rest of the day today as I'm saying this. Um, but maybe if they don't make a major move there, if they can't work something out and they have to maybe add a guy off the street or something, that's when I think Cobb could potentially have value. And in that scenario, do you think he kind of comes up near that Cole Beasley, Jamison Crowder range? Or do you do you think Cobb is like a major step down from them, even without another tight end to replace Tanyan? I would say he's more of a step down because like to me, Beasley and Jamison Crowder, I think they have more like clear value in terms of like if you're if they're just running like a quick option route, um, if they're getting shallow mm -hmm. underneath, if they're just running like a quick slant, I think that's really more where their value is. I think Cobb is a better when he can work a little bit deeper and get into more of those like over routes and stuff like that um, and get, you know, a little bit past like the five yard mark. That's kind of where I think he can be at his best. But again, I think they it would be in their best interest to trade for a tight end. And even if they don't, I think it's just mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sold that they're going to commit to him as a passing option. Yeah. Let me mention one more time that, that we are live of Football Outsiders Monday through Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. You can chat with us live on YouTube. Uh, thanks to guys like I Love Planking that do that for us every week. We love to have you here. You can ask us trade questions, whatever. We'll get to them at some point during the shows. Uh, then meanwhile, you'll also get to hear Aaron Schatz, Mike Tanier, and others handle the non-fantasy episodes Monday, Wednesday, Friday, et cetera, uh, Thursday, etc. We've got great stuff for you every day. We really appreciate you watching. Uh, Derek, we got a couple more guys uh, here to talk about from the waiver wire perspective for week nine. Got your namesake spelled a little bit differently, Derek Carr, quarterback for the Las Vegas Raiders. And I'm glad we have you on because you were able to write about him recently on Film Room and some of the improvements you've seen so far this season. It's interesting because his passing DVOA rate isn't dramatically different from what it's been re in the recent seasons. He's gone 18.9%. 14% and 13.5% so far this season. But what seems to be of changing is the aggressiveness pushing the ball down the field, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think one, he really trusts Henry Ruggs in particular down the field. And I think Ruggs, you know, to his credit, has also done a really good job of becoming a little bit more of a complete receiver mm -hmm. um, and just getting open a little bit more comfortably. And I think he has a really, there's just kind of like a natural connection where I think Carr, when plays break down, is more comfortable just throwing the ball to Ruggs than I think he really has been with with 
a- any receiver in a very long time. That's just typically yeah. not something Carr has liked to do, but he's done it with rugs. Um, so I-, I think Carr has just been generally really impressive to me. Like you mentioned, the aggression is, has been really cool. I think the reason the production has not necessarily met his improved level of play is just that the offensive line is horrible. And I'm not very sold on like Brian Edwards as a receiving option. I really don't love their receivers outside of uh, Ruggs and Renfro. Um, Obviously Waller is a really good receiving option as well, but he's not a wide receiver. Um, So I think they could probably use another guy to complete the offense and then obviously fix the offensive line. Also hurts that their run game is just non-existent because they've had a lot of injuries and stuff there. So I think, it's kind of this trade-off where he's playing better and the offense is worse and it's kind of just met at like back to the middle. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But, but generally I'm, I'm pretty comfortable betting on quarterbacks that are just playing well. So I think I, I yeah. would be pretty, I would feel good about Carr. I agree. And the statistics are, are definitely backing up what you're saying there. His 8.8 yard average depth of throw is the fifth highest among quarterbacks this season. Lamar Jackson's way up there at 10.5. Uh, but then guys like Mayfield, 9.2, Wilson, 9.2, Stafford, 8.9. That's the kind of range he's living in, which is pretty impressive for a guy that like, I guess had a rap for years that he was really more of a check down guy. Uh, maybe not as good in real life as, as he was from a fantasy perspective. I'm trusting it. His 8.5 yards per attempt is a career high by more than half a yard. He's averaging 324 passing yards per game that's up hugely from the last six years when he was really consistently in that like 230 to 260 band so i've been very impressed and i think the fantasy numbers are probably going to follow the touchdown total hasn't been huge maybe this is a team that likes to rely a little bit more on josh jacobs near the goal line but to me that's a luck thing as well where i think Carr could be a top 10 potential option for you the rest of the season and maybe your safer bet from that perspective if you're trying to take a gamble on somebody like Taysom hill um, or like Mike White, who we'll discuss shortly, um, then yeah, Carr might be a good player to have on your bench as a safety valve because I think it's unlikely that he's going to be much worse than the 15th quarterback from fantasy the rest of the way. Mm-hmm. All right, the moment everybody's been waiting for. You've stuck it out for 45 minutes just to hear about this. Derek, what are your thoughts on Mike White, the new, the next in line, I guess, of Tom Brady, Dak Prescott, and Mike White? Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll start with the positive. Um, he did a really, really good job this past week of just getting the ball out at the top of his drop, not letting pressure get there, um, flipping the ball to Carter or, or Crowder or whoever, and just making sure that the ball was out of his hands and he was trusting the system to do what it needed to do. He helped make the offensive line look better than I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the turnovers like weren't really his fault. Like I think Crowder had a fumble the interception was like a kind of a tipped pass or at least one of his interceptions. Like, so I, I think some of the things that went awry were not necessarily his fault. Um, what I would say is that I think the Bengals defensively looked horrendous um, <laughs> in coverage for the most part. I think especially over the middle of the field, their, their linebackers did a really bad job of, of passing off routes and, and squeezing windows. So it really gave White um, pretty easy opportunities to make a lot of those throws. And to his credit, he did again, but like, I think, he's probably not going to have it as easy as he did um, in the weeks to come, especially yeah. now that teams know what the offense is going to look like with him, as opposed to what it looked like with Wilson. I think that was probably part of the Bengals issues too, because um, they were running a lot of vanilla stuff. Um, just a lot of like really basic um, cover three, cover one type of stuff. Yeah. Um, it just didn't seem like they had very many answers for what the jets were trying to do. Um, so, you know, he, he played well and he can probably be this style of player again, but the 400 yards or even 300 yards is like, I don't know how much that's going to happen again. And I guess the last thing I'll say is to his credit, if you're going to be this like spot starter quarterback that can win games, you need to one, do all the, the safe stuff that I was saying that he did a pretty mm-hmm. good job of, but you do need to make a couple of big boy plays a game. And yeah. he did. He had the one um, to, I think it was Braxton Berrios where he was like fading away from pressure to his left. That's an NFL throw, man. And if, you know, I don't know how <laughs> consistently he's going to be able to do that, but at least he, he showed that he can, and maybe you can get, you can catch him with a bad defense um, on the other end in, in one of these upcoming weeks. Yeah. I mean, there's a pretty major disparity between his basic stats and his advanced metrics for his performance this week, 405 passing yards, three passing touchdowns, obviously very good. Did he catch a Philly special or did I have like a fever dream that that happened? I don't even know. Regardless, the basic stats looked really, really good. Advanced stats looked okay. Like 2.1% more completions than expected per next gen stats. That looks good. But the thing that I honed in on is that he averaged 3.9 air yards per pass attempt. That's very low. Um, 
I, these numbers, I think uh, Vince uh, Verhe, our editor, is probably going to correct them in the actual article that goes up today uh, for the waiver recommendation because I'm working from some basic sport radar data here. But 6.2 average yards after the catch for my numbers it was the highest among quarterbacks this week. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo was at 5.8, Roethlisberger 5.4, no one else above 5. So this was very much like a, a low-depth passing offense where guys were working after the catch to make him look good. We talked about Michael Carter being one of those, but some of the slot receiver too, like the Jameson Crowder types, I think really helped him get yards after the catch. So easy throws that led to big production. I would say this was probably a better strategic game than it was necessarily a great performance by White, not to give him any less credit. I mean, he did what he needed to do for the team, which is great. But my question is, again, you're, you're seeing that both he and Jimmy Garoppolo were at the top of this list. Robert Sala and their offensive coordinator, is it Mike LaFleur, whichever LaFleur it is, they both came out of that San Francisco mm -hmm. offense or team, not necessarily offense in Salah's case, but like coming from the Kyle Shanahan tree, Shanahan being well known for a very quarterback friendly yards after the catch type of offense. Where was this with Zach Wilson, right? Like this is the type of game that he should have been playing too. So Derek, do you have any insights on like why this worked for White and why Wilson hasn't been playing this way? Because he can't. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like if, if you watch him at BYU, he, he was accurate. Um, and I think he was really good with a lot of the play action stuff that, that they did at BYU. They basically did like the Shanahan offense from pistol, um, which kind of makes more sense if you're in college and you have, you know, different splits and stuff you can work with. But he was never a guy who like when they went to true drop back concepts where it was quick game or, you know, you got to get the ball out at the top of your drop. Like he just didn't do that. There were a lot of times where he would pass on open shallow routes and just like, mm -hmm chuck a prayer up down the sideline that was really bad process but it worked because he was playing against um you know william and mary basically like it, yeah it, it just i just don't think coming out of college he was a guy who had a very consistent process on a lot of these drop back concepts um which i, I mean he could develop that i mean who knows mm -hmm. like it's he's sure. still very young but i think this year that's not really going to happen at all whereas mike white is a guy who i think when he was coming out of college that was kind of his specialty he was more of a guy who could do the traditional drop back stuff, but he wasn't at really much of a playmaker. Um, and White, even though he's not spectacular, has a few years of NFL experience and he knows what these NFL defenses look like a little bit more. So I think it's kind of just a, a mix of play style and experience um, for Zach Wilson as opposed to White. I mean, these two guys, they really could not be any different, <laughs> um, which I which I guess was, you know, when you have to have one randomly come off the bench, it's pretty good. Uh, you yeah, know, you get absolutely games every now and then. It just it strikes me as weird or ironic or whatever the word would be that like you had the two teams picking near the top of the draft that have this yak type of offense and neither one of them went with Mac Jones, the player that like more naturally fit in with the 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 team that they had or the style they wanted to play with schematically. So it's like, it's a really weird situation. So we'll have to see how that kind of unfolds from here. Uh, that's the end of our waiver wire list, but we had a couple questions come in on the YouTube chat. Again, you can chat with us live on YouTube, one to 2 PM Eastern time, Monday through Friday. Uh, Lee Shaker asks, Hey guys, should I trade Jonathan Taylor, Herbert, Eli Mitchell for Christian McCaffrey, Amari Cooper and Javante Williams? He gives us some some backup options, but I'm not going to dig too much into that because it's it's mostly like a position for position trade. The answer for me is no, you shouldn't do this, and it's because Christian McCaffrey's injury situation just scares me. Like I know that he may come back this week or next week from the hamstring thing, but it's been like four different issues, a lot of them soft tissue related issues over the last year and a half. And to me, like given his vo volume of workload in his career something else could prop up. And I just, I feel a lot more safe that the Taylor's going to make it through the rest of the season that I, I just wouldn't pull the trigger there um, as much as I would, I would want it. Like if you had the, if you could guarantee that all three, all four of these guys or all six of these guys were going to play, then I might like it. But uh, as it is, I don't, what do you think, Derek? I, I think I'm with you. Um, and Taylor is just like the offensive line has actually done a, a much better job blocking. And I think now that they have more guys back in the passing game, that's kind of, opened up the running game in a way because mm -hmm. defenses now have to play them a little bit differently. You know, Wentz has been pretty willing to push the ball down the field. And if he's going to do that, it's going to create a little bit of these lighter boxes. So Taylor's the best player. I think he's going to be able to continue producing. I think even Frank Reich made like a comment that they want to really keep giving him the ball. So I think he's probably the guy who just, you want to keep him no matter what. And yeah. And to so, your and, point, like CMC's yeah. injury stuff is, is pretty tricky too. Yeah. And I love planking in the chat says that following up on that is a time to move on from Christian McCaffrey. 
I'm thinking that he might be talking about the Panthers specifically. They there was like a rumor that they might be willing to include him in a Deshaun Watson deal. And like, yeah, I bet they would be willing to include a guy that's making 20 more million guaranteed than he deserves to make because of his injury status. Like they would probably love to get rid of him, uh, but they're not going to be able to trade him. And I think once he comes back, he is going to play a lot. Um, but I just, you know, Okay, so this is actually more of a uh, fantasy situation for him. I would say if you have McCaffrey on your team, you're kind of stuck. I don't think you can really do anything but play him the rest of the way because you're not going to get like a fair one-to-one value for him for a running back, I wouldn't say. Um, Like, you know, could you trade him for Michael Thomas and trade your headache for a different headache? Like, I I wouldn't do like I wouldn't do that. You know what what I mean? Weird situation that would be. I wouldn't do that. So I I would just I would just roll with him, and then you're hoping that you get him healthy for the fantasy playoffs. I think that's kind of where you are in that situation. Uh, I'll mention two things. I love planking for some breaking news. We're not going to comment on that until we see more. Um, So that could potentially be a big story, but there are probably other big stories in the trade deadline today as well. So hope everybody enjoys that. Hope it doesn't screw up your fantasy team too much. Maybe it leads to some good waiver wire opportunities and feel free to ask both Derek and I questions like that on Twitter. We'll be happy to answer them. He's uh, at, at QB class. I'm at Scott underscore Spratt. Uh, thanks so much for everybody for listening. Again, you can come come back tomorrow here. Mike Tanier and Aaron Schatz do an ask me anything, some real football world talk, which you'll really enjoy. Check that out. And for one more time, let me also mention that FO Plus is now on sale for just 99 cents a week for annual subscriptions. It's a limited time offer, so you can get some great stuff, including a lot of the fantasy projections and other work that I do up there. Don't miss out on this. Head to footballoutsiders.com slash subscribe or follow the link in the show. Thanks so much for listening, guys. I'll be back on Friday discussing the week nine fantasy preview. We'll plan to catch you then.